Good evening everyone, time for another member update. Now this is the daily chart of silver provided by netdanaia.com. Um, you can see here a couple of indicators, the volume and the MACD. Uh, the volume is not where it was during these two periods of massive volume. You can see, relatively speaking, the volume that we're in is, is very, very tiny. The MACD, you can see, is moving down after uh, making a top there, and the um, just the lines in the chart seem to be forming this kind of uh, descending flag, pyramid, whatever. Uh, so we're, we're looking for new lows uh, on this move. Um, really, the only prices that we have below where we are right now is this spike low. Um, and just a few of these back in November, but other than that, we're we're plunging the depths here with these lows. Now, um, even more dramatic than this, and uh, it's just going to be a matter of entertainment to watch how low they can take gold and silver. But uh, even more dramatic than those two is the action in the currencies. Now you can see the same thing here with gold. Uh, with the, the volume spikes, big one there forming the bottom, big one there forming the top, then just declining down here. So don't know what to make of that. We'll just have to wait and see what the resolution is. Uh, it's going to be wild and crazy. So let's look at some of these currencies. Now you know I've been watching a lot of these, the US dollar Swiss franc. <laughs> this is uh, insanity. Look at that move. Uh, so the Swiss franc now is back to the price it was. You can see one to one to the dollar and uh, the went down to 72 cents. So that is absolute craziness. Tell me that that is a free market. Um, there's an article on Zero Hedge right now about the Japanese stocks and the uh, Bank of Japan's buying ETFs, etc. And we're going to look at an article here uh, from Zero Hedge as well from Charles Hughes Smith, but I want to pull up some of these other currency charts uh, just to look at what's going on. Here's the yen, again, losing value. Um, let's take a look at the British pound. And uh, th th there you go, making new, lo not making new lows, but wanting to make new lows. Let's go to the weekly. Um, so for this move, there's still this uh, trend line, which appears to be broken. Of course, the oil market is kind of rolling over, um, trying to go lower. Uh, we'll have to wait and see on that one. And then one that's going to be key here that when we talk about the Perth is the Australian US dollar. And that's going to be important because the move um, down now is, is about three quarters of the way of the move up that we had at the last financial crisis recovery. You can see here was the move down, and then up, and then now we're, we're back down. So that's going to come into play when we look at the Perth prices because, well, we'll talk about that when we get there. So let's look at a few stories here. Uh, the first one I want to look at is uh, just the stories of these miners. Now, I was listening to Andy Hoffman today, and he was talking about... And by the way, this, uh, this is on my new mic. I got a new mic in. Uh, my Blue Yeti Pro died, and that was a fantastic mic. But uh, it was still in warranty, so I'm going to get that shipped back. But so, this is the new mic, so um, forgive me for any glitches I don't, this this mic doesn't have headphone feedback so I'm kind of winging it with this mic uh, we'll see how it turns out anyway this is the uh, chart a 10 year chart of Barrick ABX and uh, it's also PAAS the Pan American Silver chart and as I was saying I was listening to Andy Hoffman and Andy was pointing out that he got out uh, he was actually in the precious metal mining research 
area when he was a broker and and he says he got out in 2011 and um, has been out ever since and is has been talking about what a bust the miners are and if those of you followed me from the beginning I, I'm not sure when my first videos and blog posts came out but I've been talking about this stuff since 2007 2008 that uh, the miners are a complete bust and you can see here that this actually this chart goes back to about 2005 a little after the bull market started but not too much through the financial crisis which brought the metals down and you can see these stock prices here for both Barrick and Pan American Silver you can see uh, Barrick is the blue line and Pan American Silver is the red line and you can see that one is down 51 percent and the other is down 34 percent you can see both of them are very clearly lower than they were significantly lower than they were at the bottom at the bottom of the financial crisis so just to summarize and uh, explain to people I know I've said this a million times but it's a point that has to be emphasized so people understand it if you're a miner if you're a company whose business is mining gold or silver actually a lot of its byproduct but let's put that aside if you're a company whose whose uh, business is mining these metals and it is official government well not official technically but unofficial slash official government policy to suppress the price of what you produce you could imagine that's not going to be a good industry to be in it's a, it's the equivalent of looking at what's going on in Venezuela with mad Maduro who's blaming businesses and suppressing prices and not allowing businesses to charge a price that actually produces a profit well what happens well they just shut down and uh, it's actually more complex with these miners because beca because of the uh, interlocking board of directors factor and that's something I don't have to go in uh, time to go into but basically you have um, these boards are controlled by Wall Street and the banks and so they're not doing what's in the interest of shareholders which at this point would be probably just shutting down the business uh, but they're doing what the minions in the government and the minions in uh, the bullion banks and the banks are, are telling them to do which is to keep mining at loss and so that's why you have eventually as Andy's pointed out these companies have to go bankrupt so it's obvious to anybody that thinks about it for just a minute it's it's not a good business to be in making something or mining something or producing something that the government controls the price and suppresses its price that's going to be a bad business so that's going to be the case going forward until the suppression ends there's no point in investing in these miners especially uh, given the fact that these are uh, paper assets as well so you know there's a double risk there your 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 business is being suppressed by the government and also um, the promises that you are made are based on uh, counterparty risk and somebody that can't really be trusted so a really bad bet so let's go over and look at this article from Charles Hughes Smith about the Fed and before I do that I want to show you we were looking at all these crosses on the currencies but the big one of course is the dollar and you look at that chart uh, this is the this is the weekly let's go to daily so you look on a daily candlesticks there look at that move that is insane uh, we're talking 79 from July uh, to 99 so the dollar has gained 20 percent uh, in in eight months or so that's that's amazing and that's going to be important when we're looking at buying precious metals because if you're buying with dollars you have a very powerful currency to buy with and you have a very suppressed price I mean uh, that is a fantastic deal but let's look at this article about the Fed now the Fed is in a box and they're in a really bad box because now you can see the dollar rising 
dramatically. Now, traditionally, and this is just the way things would work in a free market, we don't have free markets anymore, but the classical theory of competing currencies is that uh, if a central bank wants to attract interest in its currency because uh, whatever reason people are selling the currency or people don't want the currency, then the obvious thing to do is to raise interest rates. And what that does is that rewards people for taking the risk of, of holding that currency or holding assets that are denominated in that currency. So it's a natural thing in a, in a normal system to see a country that uh, their currency is getting weak to see the central bank raise rates. Now, what's interesting about this situation is that the, the dollar has absolutely exploded in value before the Fed has raised rates. So what does that do? Well, um, if, if this isn't an anticipation of the Fed raising rates, and it very well may be an anticipation that the Fed is going to raise. And if the Fed raises, of course, they're going to be the first one to do it and that would be leading the world. So maybe this is a bet that they'll be the first one to raise rates. Or it might be the case that they can't raise rates and that they're actually in a box and they've actually drawn out these sustained low interest rates all the way out to the next recession cycle. And that means absolute disaster. So let's read a little bit of this from Charles Hughes Smith. The Fed had multiple opportunities to let the air out of unsustainable asset bubbles by notching interest rates higher and tapering its asset purchases, QE. The Federal Reserve blew it by not normalizing interest rates a long time ago. The consensus in financial circles is the exact opposite. The Fed has blown it in the past by nudging rates up too early. Let's examine the idea that the Fed can possibly go wrong keeping interest rates at near zero for as long as it takes to create inflation. The Keynesian cargo cults talisman and push unemployment below 6%, mission accomplished. One problem with this keep interest rates low forever strategy is that it leaves the Fed no room to lower rates in the next recession. By keeping interest rates at near zero for six long years of quote unquote recovery, the Fed is now facing a global recession with no real policy options to lower rates. The Fed blew it by waiting six long years to even discuss raising rates. Let's consider the impact on the real economy of a 1% rise in the Fed funds rate. The move from 0% to 1% is not very large in terms of its impact on monthly payments for borrowers. Borrowers with poor credit are paying in excess of 15% right now on credit cards and subprime auto loans, and many student loans are 7 to 8% range. A 1% increase isn't going to impact these borrowers much. As for mortgages, if a buyer can afford a 1% notch up in interest rates, he she has had no business, I'm sorry, cannot afford a notch. Uh, he had, she had no business taking the mortgage in the first place. Who, who's using adjustable rate mortgages, they, you should be getting 30 year fixed. Anyway, if a borrower has to stretch the maximum to qualify, they shouldn't be borrowing the money in the first place. Those who plead for zero interest rates forever are saying that the US economy is so fragile that the slightest tick up in interest rate costs will collapse the entire recovery. If the economy is that dependent on marginal borrowers, then the recovery is bogus. If growth is all based on extending more credit to marginal borrowers, it is an extremely fragile expansion that is doomed by the inevitability of marginal borrowers defaulting. The Fed's extend and pretend has only increased the fragility of the economy and guaranteed a larger systemic crisis in the future. Zero interest rates policy, ZERP, has only encouraged moral hazard and asset bubbles blown by soaring corporate debt and margin debt. Another reason the consensus wants ZERP forever is to keep federal borrowing costs low so the Treasury can borrow trillions of dollars at low interest rates. If the cost of borrowing trillions more is low enough, there is no need for any politically painful debate, and there it is, about what the nation can afford with nearly free trillions everything can be paid for with borrowed money. Now this is going on all over the world. We have governments who, and, and this is what is really hilarious to me, is that we have people like, uh, well, there's a lot of them. There's Bill Still and Karen Hudas and all these people. And a lot of people who want the, 
the Treasury to issue debt-free notes and things like that. Well, we can see that the political pressure to print free money uh, is so incredible that politicians won't have to face the the music of them promising more than the taxpayers can bear. Um, Social Security, pensions, all this stuff, healthcare, uh, disability, all this, all these promises that politicians make that can't be kept. Um, it's going to be even more of a disaster if we directly give the power of printing money to politicians. Uh, I'm not saying the Fed's a good thing, but in, in this case, it's actually somewhat of a mediator on that. So if, if you think that giving the power of the purse directly over to Congress to print debt-free money is going to solve things, you're, you're dead wrong. The problem is not the Federal Reserve. Yes, the Federal Reserve is a huge problem, but the problem is taxing people to give the money to other people and then having politicians who make promises that cannot be kept. That is the big problem. That's what's going all around, that's going on all around the world, and that's why these currency devaluations are going on all around the world. And apparently that's the reason why all this money is rushing into the U.S. dollar. So on that note, I wanted to take you back to the U.S. dollar, Australian dollar cross because I've been spending some time looking at the Perth Mint. Um, now, that's almost close to the silver price. I'd, I'd like to actually, we'll do a cross real quick here on uh, the Aussie dollar and silver in dollars just to see what that looks like because they, they seem to be almost parallel. So they're not quite, they're somewhat correlated, but you can see both of them crashing at the same time. So the Australian dollar is crashing, the price of silver is crashing. What does that mean? Well, that's really bad for the Perth Mint if the Perth Mint is somebody that is state-run and represents the interest of Australians. Um, they're selling off the assets at the cheapest prices that have ever been. So what's interesting about this now, I uh, we'll, we'll go to Gainesville first because I watched the main four for me now. The main four are Atmex, Provident, JM Bullion, and Gainesville Coins. Now when we go over to Gainesville Coins, I always sort, you know, I always sort um, from lowest price and this we're just looking at Lunar Series here. Now it a similar pattern occurs, is occurring in the Koala series and in the Kookaburra series. But just to look at it in the Lunar series, you can see here, this is the first time I've ever seen this from lowest price. The lowest price Lunar coin at Gainesville right now is 42 bucks for a half ounce proof. That's the best deal you can get. And there, there's the tiger right after that. They don't have any Lunar series. Why? Now, if you think about it, if you had a situation where, well, people say, well, no one's really interested. No. If you had a situation where no one was interested, you'd see a ton of coins that no one wants. So this is the exact opposite. Now, where is the squeeze occurring? I don't know. But my guess is it's happening in Australia. If you think about it, um, the prices now are lower than they've ever been except for maybe in the 90s looking at how low the value of the, the Australian dollar is and how low the price of silver is. Um, we're at about 15 bucks and then with the Aussie dollar you might be able to take 30 percent off of that so that's maybe a third. We're talking about maybe 10 bucks for silver uh, does does the government of Western Australia really want to sell off their silver for ten bucks? I don't think so, and we're we're not seeing it. We're not seeing them sell it. Uh, now here is one that I've done on Atmex. This is Kookaburras, and the availability. Let's go ahead and do that availability here on the Lunar series. We'll just do all coins, and we'll do the low to high. And I really wish they would create a filter for these plastic, you know, holders and be able to filter that out. But they don't seem to have it right now. But here is the low to high. And the first coin we get in here, here it is here. The 
half ounce lunar goat and that's 12.78 now I, I think if you shop around you can find that one cheaper at Provident uh, this is probably going to be Provident or uh, um, a JM Bullion I, I think I saw those for 11.50 so that's going to be one we want to keep an eye on if, if silver goes lower here's our half ounce horses you can see they never dropped and the uh, half ounce dragons I was really surprised to see um, the half ounce dragons now you can see them they're all the way up here at 34 bucks for the half ounce dragons that's what they're asking of course that's not what they're bidding but we piled into these at 12 bucks so um, it's crazy what's going on I'm not really sure but my guess is that Perth Mint Silver is starting to dry up and uh, so the recommendation um, that some of the members are looking at and this is one I'm kind of on the fence on because it has a pretty high premium here this is this 2015 one ounce uh, Kookaburra Goat Privy you could see 2556 now that's pretty steep if you think about that's that's almost 10 bucks above spot. That's pretty high. I, I don't like to pay that. I like to pay five bucks above spot. And if, if a coin is ridiculously priced, like the dragons were at the one ounce, um, you know, it was a hundred bucks, then they dropped to 75. When you have a coin that's that high, I just look for something similar to it. And in that case, it was the half ounce and the two ounces. So I'm on the fence on this, this goat privy. Yes, you probably will do fine on this one. Um, if history is a guide, this one will be in the 30s and 40s very, very quickly. Uh, but that's not the best buy I'm, I'm thinking right now. Uh, I will be looking at, personally, will be looking at the half ounce goats, looking to pick them up at around $11 if we get the big drop off that this seems to be forecasting here when we get into the say 30 minute chart here so if we get that big drop off down below 15 and maybe even into new lows I'm probably going to be looking at that half ounce goat series that's really the only thing out there that I'm seeing value in and we'll talk to you next time